In this video we're going to take a look at page 26 from Drake's Data Structures and Algorithms in Java, which is the first pass or first draft of the Beetle game. So going ahead and filling in some of the administrative bits, I'm going to follow the process that, well, the, I'm going to do this in the order I would write things. So first I would implement the fields. When I'm writing a class, the first thing I ask myself is what data do I need to represent? And to play the beetle game, I need two beetles. I need bug one, and I need bug two. In the book, these are spread out across two statements. I've placed them in one. Um, and I also need a die. And that's everything I need to play the game. I need two bugs, and I need a die. Once I've done that, the next thing I would do is implement the constructor. That's the special method that sets everything up in the class. Remember in one of the previous video I said you should always provide a value for every field in a class. It doesn't matter if that field is an int or if it's a bug, I should say a beetle. Um, we need to initialize every field. So, as I write the constructor, which have the same name as the class, so public beetle game, I need to initialize bug1. So bug1 will be equal to a new beetle object. Bug2 will be equal to a new beetle object. And the die will be equal to a new die object. So in each case we call a constructor for that class with new. And I should get a complete clean compile and I don't because I forgot a semicolon at the end of one of my field declarations. Now notice in the UML diagram that arrows have appeared. I didn't have to add them myself because BlueJay did it for me. So here now I can create a new beetle game and if I inspect it I'll see the three fields bug1, bug2, and the die. If I double click on the arrow what I see is that there's a beetle. Just like we wrote in the previous video I can actually look at all of the fields. And if I look at the die what we'll see is that it has a top face and by default the top face is set to 1. Now that I know that my code works, and I recommend that you stop periodically to make sure that you haven't created some complex syntax error for yourself. It's easier to find errors in smaller amounts of code. Now this next line of code will require a bit of explanation. I recommend that you look at the text, and I recommend that you ask questions in class if you don't understand what's going on. What we're doing is we're creating a new scanner object, we'll call it input, and it's going to uh, call on the scanner class which is part of the java.util package. Now I can actually shorten this line if I want to by pulling out some of this and saying that we can actually, well I can import java.util.scanner. Now I can just refer to scanner directly because I've imported the package from the Java standard library. This shortens the code a bit and it could not fit in one line. Um, that input object is what we will now use going forward to read from the console. This is what will give us interaction with the game, uh, the game players. So the last thing we need to do is to be able to run this from the command line we will need a main. And that's sort of, that's the critical relation there. We could in BlueJ just interact with this directly, but if we want to be able to run this off the command line as a standalone game, we'll need a main. Right, public static void main string args. And here, I'm going to go ahead and print a banner for the game. It says, Welcome to the Beetle Game. Not to be confused with some other trademarked game of a different name. And I'm going to create a Beetle Game object. Now that's just the first draft. We can find out does that work. We compile and there's no syntax errors. It's always nice when you're copying from the book and you don't get syntax errors. And then we'll say let's create a no, not a new beetle game, let's run main, no arguments, and it prints welcome to the beetle game. When you're working with BlueJ I find that it's actually useful, oops, I find that it's useful to set the option that says clear screen at method call. That way every time you run a method it clears the, the buffer. You may not want that in some circumstances, but in this case if we're testing main we want to see a fresh run each time. 
So that's figure 124. Uh, I highly recommend that you think a bit about the input and you think about the structure. And that's it for this video.